Welcome back to RSA Conference 2022. We are recording live at the Marriott Marquis. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this interview segment is Paul Mackay. He is Principal Analyst at Forrester. Paul, welcome to San Francisco. Thank you very much for having me. When was the last time you were here? The last time I was here was actually at RSA in 2020. It seems very strange when we consider that that was probably the last time that many of us actually went on a business trip. And this is certainly my first time to the U.S. since then. So it's, it's great to be back. Yeah, it's it's my first time back to San Francisco since that exact same conference. We were recording Broadcast Alley. After the, after the show, my wife and I went up to wine country for the weekend. We leave on Sunday and everything shuts down literally the next day. And a lot of us have not been back here since. So it's it's great to be back in person. Yeah, definitely. I think think it's very different being in person to being oh, on a virtual background or the bookcase that yes. everybody has behind them. Yes, exactly <laughs> right. Yes, that is for sure. So your research touches on a few different areas, but we're going to talk about vendor consolidation, platform consolidation, yes. probably more specifically, right? So we talk about consolidation a lot. We talk about it on my podcast, for example, of Business Security Weekly, where we know CISOs have lots of different tools, they have lots of different vendors, they're looking for consolidation, but is that is it actually happening? The reality is, is that it's not. <clears throat> and the thing that I found really interesting is that my customers, based both in Europe and also in other parts of the world as well, talk a good game about consolidation. They know they're spending too much money, they know they've got too many security tools, they know that none of them talk to each other and it's complete, com <laughs> they know that it's making a huge uh, management overhead and heartache for them. And they know that the board are coming down on them like a ton of bricks on this wasteful spending. But I don't think that people understand how to do it. Mm. I think they're worried about if I consolidate, do I open myself up to new risks? And I don't think they've worked out how to bridge the gap between the IT demand to rationalize and integrate with the wider enterprise architecture and IT environment with how that impacts the security landscape that mm. they've got to protect against. So there's still a lot of behaviors around best of breed purchasing. And, you know, hands up as an analyst uh, who publishes Waves, I've got probably got something to say for that. Right. But I think the second thing I would say is that those aspects around integration are not really considered in the purchasing decisions for mm. security solutions. So I think that's one kind of reason why we're seeing a lot of talk about it. We've seen a lot of vendors that have come out with very strong consolidation plays, particularly mm -hmm. Microsoft and Palo Alto would say that are the ones that come up most strongly. Right. But from my perspective, it's still a pipe dream on a to-do list somewhere rather than something that people are actively doing something about. But it's clear that the drivers for making them do something about it are coming through too strongly now. So it's on the to-do list for every CISO I talk to in my kind of core region of Europe. So it gets interesting, right? Because you've seen some very interesting consolidation around certain, I would call, platform vendors, right? Palo Alto has made a lot of acquisitions. Checkpoints made a lot of acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Cisco, not as many as recently, but Cisco was in, in the spree for a long time, consolidating different parts of the portfolio across. Um, so does best in breed still win at a purchasing decision or is it best of breed plus the ability to potentially be a platform play? Like, does it change your decisioning in a procurement cycle if you are a broader platform, but I'm not ready to roll you out as a broader platform, does that help influence the initial purchasing decisions for some customers? Yes, I think the... The thing that's coming through much more strongly with some customers, which I think is the right way to think about this, is that some are looking at it not from a best of breed mentality, but from a best of need or a best of platform mm. perspective. So there's a couple of little things going on here. One is, do we already have investments? So the best example of this is probably Microsoft and E5 has led right. to a lot of right. <clears throat> acquisition of Microsoft portfolio. But secondly, it's not the case necessarily uniquely that platform vendors means that you have to sacrifice on the quality of the underlying solution. So one of the things I would say generally, not exclusively in all of our evaluations, but some of the platform vendors, the ones that are doing most well and winning this, this battle, so to speak, have actually improved the core capability of the individual products and the way in mm. which they integrate the rest of the platform right. portfolio to a point where they're maybe not 
in the top right of whichever analyst firm's evaluations you choose to use, but they're almost there. And when the difference between these solutions and maybe the one that is the furthest to the right and above is so minimal, you can't really justify having a different solution. So people are kind of getting to the point where some of the products are actually good solutions in their own right, right. individually for the whatever area of security that the buyer is looking to acquire in. So this is meaning that we're getting to a situation where I think looking at the broader portfolio and how it plays into a more cohesive integration story is starting to become more of the picture because they're thinking, well, I'm not necessarily having to sacrifice on the quality of the protection right. I'm getting. So you're seeing that happen more and more where it's not just about it's got to be the best solution that protects or mm. d detects or responds to this threat in the best manner. It's, is it good enough to meet my business needs? And good enough doesn't mean sacrificing for second, third, or fourth best. Right. But does it meet my needs? And is it maybe the the case that some of the differential that I'm looking at is really pretty minimal, minimal. or non-existent? Right. right. Because when you first saw some of these consolidation plays come down, the solutions weren't fully integrated yet, or they didn't have mm. all the features of the of, of the pure plays, right? But as that improves, that influences the buying decisions because it's good enough and it integrates with the rest of my investment. Because mm -hmm. I think about um, multiple vendors in the space that started in one side of the house or the other, yeah. but have acquired products to cover more capabilities. And when you look at them now, you're, you're like, well, those are strong enough. I this this works. You know, the example I go back to a little bit is um, Fortinet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I knew Fortinet as as a firewall provider first and foremost, with some interesting capabilities that differentiated them slightly over some of the other firewall players. Fortinet has a ton of capabilities under the covers in, in what they've built out, but I don't think a lot of people know it. So as a as a platform provider. How well do they market their other capabilities? How important are they in the decisions? Because I'll take Palo Alto on the opposite side for a second. Prisma Cloud, Cortex, and Palo Alto all have very strong kind of definitive brands um, around the whole Palo Alto environment, different than Fortinet. But I, my guess is maybe they're not equivalent in capabilities, but they're both going after the same kind of platform play. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's very interesting is, you know, how important is it um, that you even market some of those capabilities in the decisioning process? I think the, the thing I would come back to, and this is something that we get asked a lot about as analysts, is how does our go to market messaging resonate with customers? And I think the thing I would say is the case for most of the platform vendors is that they still market their products on individual mm -hmm. or brand based, you know, obviously Prisma Cloud is an accumulation of different right. uh, capabilities, yeah. for example. They're still marketing based on individual functionalities and features. So if I take the Microsoft portfolio, for example, I've frequently said, said that it reads like a list of features and products rather than a cohesive integrated story. And I right. think that's really one of the things that I think all of the platform vendors need to improve upon is how do they create a compelling end-to-end -end story mm. in such a way that a CISO can understand the value proposition they get both from the individual component parts on their own, but also together. But the thing I'd maybe want to come back to, which we haven't discussed yet, is we often talk about how does it integrate with the rest of the platform, Right. but it's very rarely the case that any of my customers are going to allow Microsoft to come in and paint the town particular shade of blue or Cisco a lighter shade of blue or right. Palo Alto a shade of orange. Right. They've got to operate within the co the context of which solutions already exist. Because when I'm talking to mm -hmm. clients about consolidation uh, programs, the, the very few who are actually doing it, they're looking at their individual capabilities. They're looking at things from a capability perspective and saying, where are aspects of what we're doing duplicative? We can eliminate those quite safely. Right. Where are we actually going to keep something? Right. And the business decision that the platform vendors need to make is how do we enable both our individual component parts to talk with the rest of the platform, but also with CISO's existing investments? Right. Because the reality is, is that defense and depth is not going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get CISO's ripping up 
say, for example, three years worth of investment on building a privileged identity management capability right. to junk it for something else. Or an endpoint capability. Or an endpoint capability. So right. I think this is kind of one of those things that the idea that the platform providers can say, hey, there's an API here. We can get customers to build <laughs> the integrations themselves. Right. That's, that's yeah. just not good enough. Right. So then you bring the market place concept to bear, right? Which yeah. is these platform providers have to have out of the box integrations with popular other capabilities that mm -hmm. CISOs might have in the portfolio mm -hmm. to integrate those into the platform plays. And endpoint is one of those areas that I could see. You know, you've got uh, great endpoint technologies out there and, and some people will die on that hill, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And so having those connectors to bring it into the rest of the platform uh, are, are going to be key in, in the purchasing decision as well. Because we all know creating your own one-off integration through the existing APIs is not easy. No, it's not. And I, and I think for, for the most part, CISO shouldn't be in the business of having to maintain their own development staff in which to do so. Right, exactly. And of course, they maybe have developers in the wider organization they can call upon, but that shouldn't be their core business. Their core business is to try and help secure their organization, not to act as an outsourced development shop for platform vendors. Now, to take the other side for a minute, some of the platform vendors will say, hey, but hey, Paul, we've already got marketplaces. And that's true that many of them do. But I think the concept needs to evolve to such an extent where that just becomes a standard requirement mm. across the um, security landscape. Nobody needs another single pane of glass. Right. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's not just a one-way integration. It's really a bi-directional integration right. because you want to leverage the features of the tool you're integrating and vice versa and, and leverage that data. And I think sometimes we think about these integrations as a one-way in because I want to be the single pane of glass, but mm. in reality, you're not. And so if you don't allow the other tools that you're integrating to also leverage their capabilities and benefits, then mm -hmm. you, you, you kind of limit the integration point. Of course. And I think to some extent, some people treat this as a one-way exchange of data from one platform to the other. But right. I think, and I, and, I, and, I, and I know I promised in the run-up to this uh, outside, Matt, that I wouldn't get into the topic <laughs> of XDR. <laughs> right. But I guess one of the things you see in that concept is people are kind of saying, okay, yes, there's the, the detection element and pulling the data from that, but right. in principle, you should also be able to trigger a response action Correct. to remediate or contain a threat. Now, that for me is a very valuable aspect that we need to think of in terms of those integrations themselves, which is still in its infancy, but I think we'll yeah. see more and more of that coming through in the coming months and years. Yes. Not that there won't be a lot of XDR signage around San Francisco this oh, week. Oh, of course not. You, you, of course you can, <coughs> you can, you can't move for XDR signs. I guess XDR is the new zero trust. Yes. Uh, as far as... <laughs> I do want to touch on that briefly. <laughs> okay. Because if you think about a platform play mm -hmm. and you think about the core principles of zero trust architecture produced mm -hmm. by NIST, right? I, I imagine that does create some guidance for organizations to think about what would a zero trust platform look like in the integration or the capabilities to underlie user, app, network, device, and data security, right? And mm -hmm. so does that play in the decisioning process for organizations yet, or is zero trust still too early? I mean, in the U.S. federal government, it's, it's, it's an executive order mandate. What we have not seen is necessarily that same level of adoption on the commercial side. But does zero trust architectures play into also aspects of the platform discussion? So I'll, <clears throat> I'll give an example of what I'm seeing in Europe. So I'm doing some work at the moment on an implementation program with some customers in Europe for Forrester. Now, what I would say is that from a Forrester perspective, we very much align with mm. the the view that NIST have, that it's about all of those different dimensions right. around zero trust. And certainly some of my colleagues in the past have uh, looked at platform vendors from the perspective of how do they build capabilities that allow you to implement zero trust from end to end. Right. Now, I think the reality is that most of those uh, platform providers may or may not have gaps in certain parts of that picture right. and some of them mm -hmm. are trying to fill those in. But I think from my perspective, what I'm seeing in practice is that one of the vendors in particular... Um, and, I, and I'm a little bit reluctant to say this, but it is Microsoft, <laughs> is the one that's being used more more often by my customers in Europe because mm. they've got the investment in, in Azure. Yep. Now, in Europe, we're very behind in terms of our adoption of cloud, cloud yep. platforms because uh -huh. of concerns around data sovereignty. But we're starting to see 
a massive shift towards cloud in Europe, accelerated by the pandemic. So lots of clients are moving in that space and are undertaking cloud transformations. And the zero trust security model happens to be quite nice in terms of its ability to secure that underlying transformation. Right. And what I'm seeing from that perspective is that when Microsoft are coming to the table with the platform play, they're saying, well, we're going to be your main cloud provider. And we also have this security capability that allows you to implement a zero trust architecture. Right. It's proving to be quite compelling. Now, that's not to say that there are not other uh, providers that Palo Alto couldn't come in and right. make a similar case and, and also sell a similar thing. But I have to say that from a commercial perspective, that's the one I'm seeing that's having the most success, most success as much as it pains me to say that, to give any vendor credit for anything. Yes, I understand. Um, so Zero Trust and XDR, we should see lots of signage for both of those around the conference this Pro week? Probably. Okay. I, I would expect so. Paul, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Matt. It's been a pleasure to, to talk to you. And thank you everyone for watching and listening. We'll be back with more interviews soon.